after Alex Hubert, uh, I'm a lead data scientist at Dataiku for Northern Europe and uh, the UK, obviously. Uh, and prior to Dataiku, I used to work as a trader in the city of London, and uh, that's uh, the reason why I'm going to give a talk today uh, around GANs and how you can be uh, using them in, in finance. I remember when um, I was in school, um, in, in business school, I had a master degree in, in financial markets, and then they were uh, teaching us the black in schools assumption, uh, lots of uh, parametric assumptions, and I was thinking, uh, like reading the, the, the new papers that you find right now, the new innovation that you find right now in the deep learning space, how can we try to find some ways of generating some uh, time series, essentially, to try to be better uh, than those uh, heuristic assumptions. So this is what this talk is about. First of all, I will, um, I will just... Um, um, re-explain a little bit the, the use case and talk about options uh, in general and what, why they are useful. I will also explain a little bit in details uh, how you can use GANs for times, uh, time series generation. And unfortunately, you don't have the third part because I don't have my laptop. Uh, but at the same time, we just have 18 minutes now. So uh, I think it uh, should be uh, fine. So a short history of um, option pricing and uh, option 101. That, that, that's, that's okay. Don't don't worry, thank you. Um, so, so first of all, it's, it's important to realize that options have been around for quite a while. Uh, it's a very useful financial instrument. Uh, obviously, they have a very bad reputation after what happened in, in 2008, but yeah, they're still very useful. Uh, let's talk about a concrete example. Uh, you can be a food manufacturer, for instance, uh, a biscuit manufacturer, and you know that on a monthly basis, you're gonna buy some, uh, some wheat, uh, to produce your, your, your biscuits. And um, you know that uh, there is lots of different factors that can influence the price of wheat. There is obviously the meteorological factor. Uh, there is obviously the um, um, geopolitical sometimes tensions, economical uh, factors that can make all those prices move. And you as a producer, you have to keep your prices steady to your consumer because they can't go in the market, supermarket tomorrow and see uh, a, a price at two pounds instead of one pound just because of the wheat. So what you want as um, a producer, you want to have the right uh, to buy an instrument that will give you the guarantee to buy your wheat in six months, so at a given date for a given asset. In that case, in case it's wheat. Um, and at a very certain price. So then after that, essentially you are hedged uh, against uh, the fluctuation of, your, of, the, of the wheat prices. So this is what um, an option is. It's basically a contract that gives you the right to buy or to sell a certain asset at a certain price um, in, um, at a certain date. Um, and what is it, uh, so, so when you, when you, you know, when, when you, you, you are your biscuit manufacturer, you're going to buy that obviously on the financial markets and usually those contracts are issued by the banks. Um, and the banks have to have the right, the, the right price to, for, those, for those options because they need to stay competitive. If you offer a price that is too low for that option, uh, then you can get arbitraged. I'm not going to talk about that because that's not the subject of the talk, but essentially this is a loss of revenue. And if you sell it too high, then the competition is going to be there as well to sell it at a better price than you. You can't sell it, and again, it's a loss of revenue. So it's very important to have the right price for that, uh, for that asset. So how can we have the right price for my option? So first of all, we need to take a step further for once and not uh, a step uh, backward. And we need to understand what is going to happen at expiry date. So for that, we need to understand what's the payoff of an option. So if we're talking about the, the right to buy um, an option, uh, essentially, I, the, manif the, the, food, the food manufacturer, the food biscuit, I will be willing to exercise my right to buy that option only if I realize at expiry date that uh, the price of wheat is much higher than my right. So then, yes, I will exercise my right, and then I will essentially save the difference uh, between the two. And then it's the opposite side for the put. Once I understand that, then I can put myself in the shoes of people that were extremely clever, uh, and that, 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 think that, that their process thinking was this one. It was like, it would be quite nice to have uh, some sort of instrument that would let us simulate a time series, and then once I've got a rough good um, uh, estimation of that time series, then I can apply uh, that, um, that, that, uh, that payoff, uh, that payoff function, and then I can see whether or not that option is going to save me money or cost me money. 
Um, so this is essentially what they did. Uh, they made a very strong assumption looking at this chart that stock prices could be modeled as some sort of ge ge uh, geometric burn motion looking at this because they were like, oh, okay, so if we log normalize the prices, everything is centered around zeros, looks like it's a normal distribution, so we can apply some sort of, um, um, well, not some sort, like the actual uh, discrete time version of, um, of the GBM, and then that will give me a good simulation of my, um, of my time series at a given time. So if I repeat that a thousand of times, and then this is what they're doing, so I'm simulating uh, a thousand of times some, some, um, some, some time series options, and I'm computing my payoff, then I'm making a big average of all the possible payoff, and then essentially what I have is um, a potential, a, a fair assumption of the price uh, for that option. So all those nasty charts here are just possible um, path for that, uh, for that time series. Uh, the parameters that are important here are, uh, because we're talking about a normal assumption, normal distribution, it's um, the fact that it's centered around zeros and the, the, the variance, essentially, it's the measure of risk in finance, which is, um, which is um, uh, what we call the volatility. So with those two parameters that people are making their best to, um, to estimate, they can then, again, simulate a very high number of trajectories for a given stock, then compute the payoff, as I explained at the beginning, make a big average and say, this is the fair price um, of my option. So far, so good, looks very nice. And then they realized that it didn't work well. Um, so this is uh, the comparison of, on, on the left-hand side, uh, you've got the actual empirical distribution uh, for uh, the log return of, of the stocks. And then on the other side, it's the, um, it's the, uh, the assumption around, um, uh, around the GBM. And, and, and again, you can, you can quickly see that the curve, the two, the two distributions are not that much similar, um, especially in finance, specifically to finance. You have the problem of fat tails. Uh, fat tails reflect um, the not normal um, behavior of, of, of people, either because you have a market crash, either because you see some euphoria. And you can see very well that those fat tails are not very well represented on the, on the, um, on the distribution uh, under the GBM. And it's the same in the very middle of the curve. I remember sometimes sitting on the desk and uh, nothing was happening because everyone, it was just, because everyone it was just waiting here for some economical figures, um, so it's very boring, and the market are not moving at all. Under the normal, uh, under the, the normal um, assumption, you can see that around zeros, you have much more, much, much, a much bigger number of values. So there's lots of improvement that we can do here, and um, this is uh, why uh, you probably want to um, investigate what uh, the golden standard for. Um, simulation right now can do for, for, for time series generation. So um, first of all, I, I, uh, I'm not sure if you know about that picture, but that picture is actually um, 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 some sort of yeah, a painting that has been generated by a GAN, and that was sold for, I think, uh, something like 400,000 pounds at, at Christie's. Uh, so uh, maybe this is also the, the, next, uh, the next step in art. Maybe not, I don't know. Um, so what is a GAN? A GAN sounds extremely complicated in terms of naming, like generative adversarial network, uh, but the idea is quite simple and extremely elegant. So you've got two networks, two type of model that are going to um, reuse one another, inspire one another to get much better at generating something that is um, close to the distribution, the image, the whatever you want, to, uh, you, want to, uh, you want to build. So you have a generator that is just here to build something that is there to then fool a discriminator. So let's stick to the uh, art example. We can say that uh, uh, you have uh, some, some, I don't know, my little brother, I give him a little bit of painting and then he throw the painting on the wall and then he comes to me and he's, he's asking me, like, is this a piece of art? Me, as a discriminator, I will say, no, no, like, you can do much better than that. So then, same, you will throw another, uh, another um, bucket of painting on the wall. And, and with that kind of, um, with that kind of uh, adversarial conversation with my brother and I, he's going to at some point make some piece of art that is going to be good enough so that when my parents are going to look at it, they're going to say, oh, this is great. We're going to put you in uh, school classes, in, uh, in uh, art classes next year.
That's that's the uh, that's the idea of um, of a generator against a discriminator. And once a generator is start to be really good, it can fool the discriminator so well that when you're looking at those pictures. Um, it's quite difficult for someone to say, oh, this, those ones are generated by um, a network or those ones are actual pictures uh, for human. And this is where the attention around GANs started to grow a lot. It's when you can't really make the difference between something that is real and something that is unreal. Um, to just come back to our use cases, um, again, on our side, what is important is to try to get rid as much as possible of that normal assumption that is obviously causing lots of damages because it cannot fit the curve as well as we would like to. So, and, and also because it has lots of parameters that we're trying to estimate, uh, we try to be very smart around that. But maybe, again, if we use that adversarial conversation between two networks, at some point we will be in a position to create or recreate um, um, a distribution that is good enough to really look like the one that you have um, on the market. Um, so the way um, you, the way we did that, uh, so we took all the um, historical prices of the S&P 500 uh, between 2002 and 2017. And in here, uh, it's also important to realize that there is no magic in data science and you should always be careful uh, to the kind of data set that you have and what you're doing with those ones. Uh, knowing very well how the stock market is working, there is already a big bias here when you choose S&P 500 between 2002 and 2017. Essentially, this is an index. An index is living. Some stocks are going to be delisted. And when you're just looking at those specific 500 stocks, you basically just put on the side all the ones that got delisted, and maybe you're missing some sort of, uh, some sort of event. With that in mind, then you'll, you, you have to realize that what you want to actually build is one GAN network per ticker where you have the data. If you try to do it the other way around, you're not going to do a very good job. So you took every, um, so our plan now is to build one GAN network per action and then generate some sort, of, uh, some sort of distribution. So to do that, we create some chunks of time series, size uh, 50. Um, why 50? I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, usually, it's a, it's a common parameter that you, that you choose in finance. You could take, in that case, 50 represents 50 days. Uh, you could take smaller, you can take longer. Did work well with 50. Uh, and then what we want to do is essentially generate some fake time series of size 50, again, starting from pure noise, and then send that to a discriminator and see what the discriminator is going to say about it. Um, it was a use case that we built with uh, one, uh, it's not in the room, but uh, with the other Alex in my, uh, in my team in, in 10 days. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, so we did something very simple uh, to start with, just to demonstrate uh, the value of what we were doing. So this is the actual architecture of that generator, extremely simple. It's just some dense layer that are getting stacked one another with some leaky reload in, the, in, in, uh, in between. Um, actually, because we wanted to um, we wanted to be a bit smarter. We didn't start from pure random noise. We started from uh, the actual GBM that we then tried to improve. It's good if you want to have quick results. It's not good if you want to have the best result possible because you're already inducing some bias in the way your network is working. Maybe by using pure random noise, you can find something much smarter than, than GBM. But it was good enough for us to start with. And then something extremely simple as well with the discriminator against three dense layers that uh, just to take something very big and then at some point it's just, it's just trying to predict whether or not this is uh, good, <coughs> this is an actual <coughs> time series or if it's not. Uh, on that side, do not forget the dropout. Um, I've, I've always struggled to make uh, the dropout work in, in deep learning or to see a massive improvement uh, with dropout. It's the first time that I was working on a use case where I did see a significant improvement after the, after the use of, of dropout. And then um, what, can we, uh, what, can we, uh, what can we see? Well, as I said again, I've got on the very right hand side the GBM assumption, very parametric, uh, estimation of volatility, lots of things like that. 
um, uh, black in schools. In the middle, I've got the distribution of my GAN, and on the left hand side, I've got the distribution of, I've got my empiric, actual empiric distribution. And then here, I don't need to go that much further at that stage, if I was still on a trading desk, to just run to my manager and say, well, you know, uh, we don't need to do much here to realize that the GAN distribution is actually much closer to the empirical distribution than the, than the, than the GBM. It captures much better the fat tails. It also understands much better that we have lots of time where we sit on the desk and we are just bored or we're doing something else. It's very close to zero. Overall, closer to the uh, empiric distribution. I didn't talk about LSTM so far, and I can obviously find ways to improve um, my, uh, my, my GAN. Uh, I don't have any uh, recurrent net, for instance. Um, I tried it. I didn't put the, the result here, and I can indeed tell you that if you put LSTM instead of dense, uh, this is going to, uh, to work much, faster, uh, much, much better. Overall, uh, be, uh, be careful though, uh, GAN are quite, and they are, they are very well known to be difficult to, to train and to converge. Um, I, I found when I was working on this, I found this repo, GAN Hacks, but, uh, by Sumit Shintara. It's extremely good uh, to make sure that, again, in a very limited amount of times, uh, you can achieve some, some good results and, 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 um, and avoid some caveats uh, as, much as, as much as possible. Uh, so there are plenty of ideas from that uh, from that repo that can be uh, that can be taken and that can be uh, that can be applied. Uh, for instance, I didn't uh, I didn't we didn't implement it, um, the gradient penalty on the on the generator to prevent it to identify some areas that are good enough so that uh, but that are, that that doesn't look like at all the distribution that you're trying to uh, generate, but are good enough to to fake uh, the generator. Um, I didn't. Um, I didn't, yeah, there's, there's lots of things that you, that you can do to improve. At that stage, what is really important, again, when you want to go through the uh, iterative process of data science, is that we have some quick wins here, um, and with those quick wins, we definitely could buy us some time to go to a manager, to go to someone, to go to, to someone higher in the, in the team that could then uh, ask us the right question to start to make an impact, talking about how would you productionize this, how would you, uh, how would you put that in production, how would you make a better model, how could you uh, handle the life cycle management of those different models. All those questions that you need to ask yourself to make sure that your work is now good enough so that it can make an impact in the organization, and that means that it, it is the kind of questions that you ask yourself when you want to go um, out of the lab. Um, Sorry, no option pricing in real-time demo, but it was uh, a real pleasure to uh, talk to you about this, and uh, if you want to talk about it later, I'm definitely going to be around for a while. Thank you.